Good evening, everyone. My name is Simon Godwin, and I am the Artistic Director of the Shakespeare Theatre Company in Washington, DC. We have a terrific hour ahead, and welcome to all of you, and thank you for joining us tonight. Before I introduce my guests, I'd like to say thank you to everyone, to certain individuals who've made tonight's programme possible. This episode of Shakespeare Hour Live has been generously supported by Denise Gwynne Ferguson. Foundation support is provided by the Share Fund. The Shakespeare Hour is a component of our larger artistic initiative, Shakespeare Everywhere, which is sponsored by the visionary Beach Street Foundation. Thank you again to Rectordown Methodist Church here in Rectordown, Virginia, for hosting me. Well, we are in truly excellent company this evening. We are joined tonight, first of all, by Dr. Peter Holland, McNeil Family Chair of Shakespeare Studies at the University of Yodadam in Indiana, I believe. Peter, are you there? I am. Here I am in South Bend, Indiana, just down the road from Notre Dame. Okay, I got the name sort of right, I think, Peter. Sort of right. Okay, very good. Um, so I should say to our viewers that um, Peter and I have known each other for a long time. Peter actually taught me Shakespeare at Cambridge University. So it's a particular thrill to, to see you again, Peter. How have the last few months been? It's been chaotic. It's been tense and exhausting. But the students are wonderful. They're excited to be back in the classroom face to face and just to get back to the joys of learning. Fantastic. And a bit of partying, and a bit of partying. Okay. With face so, masks on, of course. Face masks on, of course. Thank you so much, Peter. Um, well, now it's my great pleasure to introduce Dame Helen Mirren, uh, Academy, Emmy, Tony, BAFTA, and Olivier Award-winning actor. Helen, are you there? I am. How are you, Simon? Oh, I'm very well, Helen. It's lovely to see you. Where are you this evening? I'm in uh, Tahoe, Lake Tahoe. Um, which is where I now live with my husband. And we've been in, in lockdown, you know, the, when the lockdown happened, we, we were here. So it was a kind of a wonderful place to be in lockdown. Because it's beautiful there, I imagine. Very beautiful, absolutely. We've got the smoke, the smoke from the terrible California fires right now, as almost the whole of America is experiencing, um, which has been very strange and rather ap apocalyptic, but um, ve a very beautiful place to be. I'm very lucky. Yes, and have you been, can I ask, have you been sustained by Shakespeare during this period? Has he kind of been with you in spirit? Just remembering, actually, that the very first thing I did when the lockdown happened um, was to record a Shakespeare sonnet, because for some reason I immediately went to Shakespeare and I was trying to think of what I could put out into the world, you know, and the first thing I did was do a, a Shakespeare sonnet. Mm, that's beautiful, Helen. And, I, and actually, interestingly, I know we're going to be talking about The Tempest later on, but as I was watching the film of The Tempest, which you play Prospera, I was very strongly reminded of how The Tempest is a story of somebody who is uh, in seclusion and who is in some ways preparing to return to the real world. And maybe a theme we'll come back to. Mm, mm, thank you. And, and uh, I now like to introduce uh, the amazing director, Julie Tamor, Tony Award-winning director, in fact, and I'm very proud to say STC Will Award honoree. Julie, hello, good evening. Good evening, Simon and everybody. I'm so delighted and I'm so happy to be with Helen again. Oh, yes. And, and can I ask where, where you are this evening, Julie? I'm on an island. Could be the island. I'm on Martha's Vineyard. So... <laughs> And I was just told by, by Elliot Goldenthal, my other half, and the composer of The Tempest, that be prepared because we may get a hurricane next week here. Oh so, uh, you know, the hurricanes are happening and we live right on a bluff. So it's pretty rough here when it, uh, when it happens. My goodness, so, so you can hear the sea cr crashing outside your, your door. I all the time, it's there. I mean, the doors are closed now, but it's very beautiful here. And wow. I grew up coming to the vineyard. I lived outside of Boston. I grew up outside of Boston. So I used to come here every every year of my life. And then finally, we, we, we have a place. So we're very, we're, we're gonna spend winter here. This will be our first real, we think we are, unless we get blown off the bluff. Okay, well. <laughs> We're rooting for you, Julie, we're rooting for you. Um, and well, the, the, the stage is truly set for our discussion of, of Shakespeare on film and, in, and indeed in relation to The Tempest, which we'll come back to. But before we do that, of course, I must introduce my colleague and co-host, Drew Lichtenberg, STC's resident dramaturg and literary manager. Hello, Drew. 
Hello, Simon. Hello, everyone. Uh, I, and I'm saying hello from my home base in Petworth in Washington, DC. Uh, before we get to tonight's discussion of Shakespeare and film, I can't wait, I'm sure neither can you, I'd like to remind everyone tuning in of a few of the special Vimeo features. First of all, before you can start chatting or asking questions, you must enter your name in the chat dialog box first on your screen. Uh, secondarily, if you would like to submit a question for, for me, Simon, or our panel, you can do so by clicking the blue ask button. I know there was some confusion last week, so hopefully register and then click on the blue ask button and we will get your questions. And finally, of course, if we don't get to your questions tonight, do not fear. I will be answering them myself personally, fulfilling my dramaturgical duties in our customary Friday newsletter. Which brings me to tonight's theme, Shakespeare and film. Uh, Shakespeare and film is a very large topic. In fact, it goes all the way back almost to the inception of film as a medium in 1899, when uh, Sir Herbert Beerbohm Tree's production of King John was filmed only a few years after the first silent shorts were shown by the Lumiere brothers in Paris. So in the more than a century since, figures such as Orson Welles, Akira Kurosawa, Jean-Luc Godard, Sir Peter Hall, Sir Peter Brook, uh, Roman Polanski, uh, Ze Franco Zeffirelli, of course, Julie Taymor, have all put their imprimatur on Shakespeare's works. I'm forgetting Kenneth Branagh, Sir Laurence Olivier, uh, the list could go on and on and on. Um, so I don't know if we'll exhaust this topic tonight, but it seems to me just as a, as a kind of first venture about this topic that Shakespeare is reinvented continuously for the filmic medium with each generation that goes by. And also that Shakespeare serves as a kind of mirror onto the anxieties and pressures of that era. So Olivier's film of Henry V very much is about the Blitz in 1944. Uh, and I thought we would start tonight's discussion by asking our guests about some of the unique challenges that Shakespeare poses to adaptation into film and some of the challenges that filmmakers have chosen uh, in order to adapt him or in order to bring him to cinematic life. Uh, Julie, you have adapted three Shakespeare films, uh, Titus Andronicus, The Tempest, of course, with Dame Helen and Midsummer Night's Dream. So you are our expert practitioner or one of our expert practitioners joining us tonight. How, how would you begin to start answering this question? Well, I think that the uh, the actually surprising thing about Shakespeare is that he wrote cinema, you know? Because there was no cinema or television, he wrote these epic scenes, these visual splendiferous landscapes, landscapes that are exterior, landscapes that are interior. Therefore, as an ad when you're writing an adaptation, it's actually not as hard as most theater. Because a lot of theater is written for a living room, a dining room, a garage, a bedroom, you know, they're just limited. And yet, if you go back to the Shakespeare stories, there are things that we, we need visual effects for. There are fairies, there are scenes of great war, there's extraordinary scenes. Now, the huge difference, of course, is that in theater, it's left to the imagination quite often. Right. It's 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 there for the audience. You, you've got that globe theater in the traditional way and you don't have a lot of scenery. You let the language be the visual, the language. So it's our imaginations that see these landscapes. Now, when you adapt to movies like I did with Titus, I all three of the films I did, I did on stage first. And I have to say, I don't think I would be comfortable directing a Shakespeare without first doing it in the theater. And the reason is. The minimalism of the theater makes you really get to the depth of the piece. Helen knows that you go out and you make a film and all of a sudden, not only are there hundreds of people around you, but there's money ticking every minute. You know, you just, you, you actually, there's so much that's happening that is very hard to stay focused on what were you trying to do. So having known Titus Andronicus on the stage, I found it much it, it was actually a thrill to adapt that to a very fleshed out, very full scenic piece. 
but I knew it without any gimmicks, without any landscapes. And, and the other part of what I love about making films is especially for Americans who are so terrified of language and so terrified of the language. I think films are far superior for understanding the language because of the close-up. There's, this is the, the, the greatest thing that I found was, because Midsummer Night's Dream, we shot the play. So, but we shot it like a movie. Um, I'll get into that later, but we shot it like a movie. What you don't get in the theater are reaction shots, correct? You know, the director, if it's Prasini, and the director is there, and we put the person who has to be speaking towards the audience, and then you might see the back of the person listening. Well, in cinema, the who is listening adds so much to what we're watching, to who's speaking. So not only the close-up, but actually the reaction shots add so much more. And when you can see the mouth move, it's much easier to hear and understand the language. So just in a nutshell, those are, those are some of the big things that I found in adapting what I've done on stage to cinema. So in other words, Shakespeare, the expansiveness of Shakespeare's dramaturgical imagination in some ways invents the idea of the cinema, that the cinema is what it is. It's absolutely cinematic. I mean, it's, it's why someone like Kurosawa, whose Shakespeare movies I adore, and of course it's not the language, was so turned on to Shakespeare because the stories are, well, they're ancient, they're archetypal, they transcend culture, but they're visual. They are so visual. Uh, I'm interested, Helen, in hearing your uh, your thoughts and responses to this question, but we also have some questions already from our viewers. One from Maureen Dowd, who is watching tonight. Hello, Maureen Dowd of the New York Times, uh, asking what sonnet you recorded at the top of quarantine, the one that you mentioned at the top of the show. And we have another question from our viewer, Terry, wondering if you could speak about your memories of playing Hermia opposite the recently passed Diana Rigg as Helena in Peter Hall's film of Midsummer Night's Dream in 1968, which I think was one of your very early screen credits. Yes, it was, yes. I think it was, um, you know, that wonderful and so well-known sonnet, Shall I Compare Thee to a Summer's Day, that I recorded. The most familiar, I thought, would be a good one to start with. Um, I would just like to say that I absolutely agree with Julie that a deep knowledge of the play is essential going into making the film of it. You know, you don't have the rehearsal time that you do in a play. And even doing doing a Shakespeare play, you, you, you've you only just begun to excavate what it means to you at the end of rehearsals. And it's only after playing it sometimes for two or three years, I'm not saying every night, but coming back to it, that you finally start, to, the, the play really starts to... Um, you start to really understand the play or in your uh, what it means to you personally. So I think that deep knowledge of it is incredibly important. Now, when I did The Tempest with Julie, I'd seen it several times, but I'd never been in it. So the first thing I had to do was uh, uh, learn it. So the first time I'd ever done that, I learned the whole play. Um, so I had it absolutely down when I walked on the set, all of the lines, everything. That, that was an absolute essential. Uh, may I interrupt you? You played Caliban. You told me that. Oh, yes, I did. Oh, that's true. <laughs> Caliban. That was my favourite role, Caliban. Of all the Shakespeare roles, that was the one I wanted to play. But the other, and Julie's absolutely right, that Shakespeare kind of, had, you know, uh, the, the monologue he, in, in his, um, if so many of the plays have monologues, just the character and the audience, in a way he invents the close-up. You know, that is a close-up. If, if there is anything that is a close-up, it's, it's, um, it's, the, it's the character talking absolutely directly to the audience, even sometimes asking questions. Should I do this? What do you think? I don't know whether I should or not. Um, so, um, you know, there, there are many wonderful, wonderful things uh, and, and Julie is absolutely right about the, the clarity of the language. It's so much easier having done a lot of Shakespeare on stage and a lot of Shakespeare on film to be able to speak the language in a simple human normal way it is so advantageous. You know, the language can be very dense and complex. It's so much easier if you don't have to shout it. 
And, and that was always my problem in the theater was how to make the language as visceral and as meaningful and as emotional and as human as it is to you inside of you as an actor, but at the same time having to shout so, you know, the people in the back row can hear you. Um, and that was always a problem. And, and that problem is gone on, on film. And, it, and that's very, very liberating. There are other problems that come with it, but, but you know, that those, those are the things that I found so, you know, informing for me. Yeah, it occurred to me when Julie was talking about reaction shots that that's one of the reasons Shakespeare gives these characters asides in a play like Measure for Measure, Lucio is constantly cheating out to the audience and narrating uh, his reaction. And in a movie, it seems like you could just cut a lot of that out and show the reaction on the character's face. Uh, Peter, I want, I want to bring you into this conversation. How do you respond to what you've heard from Julie and Helen so far? I, I, I mean, I agree with everything they've been saying. When uh, Helen was talking about the effect of soliloquy, what flashed into my mind was the Hamlet's first soliloquy, oh, that this 2-2 solid flesh would thaw, melt, dissolve, um, in the wonderful Russian film directed by Grigory Kozintsev. And he does something so simple and something you cannot do on stage. He sets the scene in a crowded room full of ambassadors, courtiers, and so on. And Hamlet is walking through the room and we hear, we hear the soliloquy, but we don't see his lips move. We don't have to watch him speak it. And Cousins have writes about the way in which what, so, what is so powerful for him is the idea that the loneliest place can be in a crowded room. And Hamlet, who is so terrifyingly alone at that moment, can show us his isolation by that very simple film device, the voiceover, that transforms our awareness of what's going on. And at that moment, we know that's a film imagination. I mean, Kozintsev was also a great theater director. Uh, he directed Hamlet on, on stage. But when he turns to film, he thinks in filmic terms. And for me, that's always what I'm looking for, not just somebody who says, oh, um, it's very easy. We just have the actors and they speak and it's as if it's on stage. No, you have to completely reimagine it. And the reimagining, as Julie has, has proved so brilliantly in, in both Titus and Tempest and very differently with, with Dream, it, that involves rethinking what we mean by the real. Shakespeare works in a space which is real and unreal at the same time. I mean, nowhere more so than, than in The Tempest, where Prospero's imagination fills that island and Ariel's brilliance transforms everything that is occurring. And we can see that afresh in film in a way that actually on stage, our imaginations have to do that work. I think there is a different problem about language in terms of film, and it's something we have to confront with Shakespeare. Um, Polanski talked at one point about how the greatest influence on him when he was growing up in his teens, he, he saw Olivier's film of Hamlet, and he said he, he saw it 20, 25 times. He was just blown away by it. So as a teenager in Poland, and what he loved about it was that absolutely lucid quality of the, the verse speaking. That there isn't a moment in that film where you think, I don't understand what that person is saying. Even if the words are unfamiliar, I get it. It's there in, in that version of Midsummer Night's Dream in which Helen, Helen played Hermia, some of the most wonderful verse speaking I've ever heard. Absolute clarity of thought, but, and it is a but, Film can't cope with a lot of language. Cinema as a form doesn't like long speeches. And you have to reinvent film to find a way in which what is so characteristic of Shakespeare, how that language is operating, can have enough space. I remember Adrian Noble, when he was running the Royal Shakespeare Company, saying that one of the things that had brought people back to Shakespeare was watching Quentin Tarantino films. And the Tarantino films, not because of their style, not because of their violence or anything else, but Tarantino likes long speeches on films, certainly in, in the early films. And that that has a quality of, of delivering a speech that is very much how Shakespeare thinks. 
It's not rapid fire dialogue. It's not one liners all the time. It can be, but it tends then to move into those moments where we are, our brains are exploded by the imagination of that space in which somebody is thinking and speaking as they speak to somebody else or as they speak to us. Simon, you have a, you're, you're muted, I believe, Simon. A classic error, of course, everybody. We're glad to have got that out of the way, the, uh, the speaking was muted. Um, I find that very interesting, Peter, and I'd love to, to ask Helen and Julie about that because I, 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 I'm interested in what it's like. So we know on the stage when you're doing a long speech that somehow you're sustained by the audience. You're sustained by their laughter or their, their, their alertness or their murmuring. What's it like recording long speeches on camera and how does one keep that tightrope of intensity going? Maybe I could ask Helen and then Julie to, to speak about that. Well, you know, the, I, I guess it, 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 it's very, um, it's rather nerve wracking because you know, you've probably only got, maybe if you're lucky four or five goes at this, you know, whereas if you do it in the theater, you've got tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow, <laughs> so to speak. Um, uh, so the, it, it, it's what makes film acting wonderful. And it's also what makes film acting terrifying is that it's do or die. You've got to go where you're going to go and you've got to go now. You can't, you know, wait, you've, you've just got to do it. And, um, and, and with Shakespeare, the thought process, you know, the, the, the words, the imagination it is so rich in your brain. Um, I mean, it, it, it's, a, it's a wonderful thing. And yet it, it's sort of heartbreaking as well, because you always think, oh, oh, I just want to do that again. To this day, Julie, incidentally, I still do speeches of The Tempest thinking, oh, why didn't I do that? That would have been so much better, <laughs> you know. Um, one, which speech? <laughs> oh, you know, the one that we love, the, the, the one that we're going to show, actually. Oh, really? one of the most beautiful pieces of writing in Shakespeare. Um, you know, when, when, when Prospera lets go of her, of her magic, says it's time to, to move on. It, it's so beautiful. Um, <clears throat> but uh, yes, I, I, I think what, what Peter was saying was, was very, very, very interesting and, and very, very true about language. And, um, and it's fast. I think Adrian, I know Adrian very well. I worked with him. Um, observation of, of it being like Quentin Tarantino, I think is brilliant, you know, because Tarantino's language does have that sort of fabulous, imaginative sort of energy to it. Yes, wonderful. I Peter wants to come in there with another thought in response to that. But Julie, just before, yes, Julie, your, your thoughts on, on su sustaining this energy towards yes. life. Yeah. Think yeah. Well, let me, I, I can use Titus really, because uh, it, there's a speech by Marcus when he sees Lavinia, and it's very long, you know, when he sees who, who, what is my niece, I mean, this is like 20 years ago, so who has locked and hewed and made thy body bear of her two branches, blah, 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 blah. I, I still remember some of it. <laughs> but I remember when I was working on the stage, you know, Peter Brook, of course, cut that speech because from what I read, he cut it because if her hands are chopped off, what is he, you know, he got into the reality of things. It was very odd. What, how could her uncle be standing there? She, you know, and not do anything as opposed to, it's abstract. It's an inner, for me, it's an inner thought that probably only takes two or three seconds of thought. But of course, this is what we know about Shakespeare. It takes however long to speak it, but in reality, it's only a second or three seconds. So what I found and what I think is important, and Simon, you're going to discover this if this is your first feature that you're going off to do with Shakespeare, is camera movement and editing. But I think people over edit, you know, in general, in film now. I, when you see the clips with Helen, when you can, you try to hold it. But if, if it's just the slow move in of the camera, it really helps, or a pull out, or you're very, very wide. And you just, it's the angle of the camera, it's the speed of it. All of this makes a long speech not long. 
I, I, I think it's music, you know, it's physical music. So I, I haven't really found that to be a problem. I don't think that in The Tempest, we didn't really, The Tempest is edited, but I, it's not because the speeches were too long. You know, it's, it's a different kind of editing. Um, and I didn't feel that was a problem with the actors. Um, but I think, Judy, you speak about this beautiful Shakespearean paradox about a thought taking seconds, uh, as swift as meditation, I think Hamlet says, yes. a thought that mm -hmm. takes seconds, and yet, the pleasure of a long thought that is being nurtured into language. And that's a very beautiful process, isn't it? To be, to be a witness of in any format. But Peter, I know you wanted to come back. Uh, oh, I, I, okay, yeah. No, I wanted to add one more thing because in, in Dream, this was the other one, you know Titania's uh, beautiful long speech, right? About, what is it, uh, Peter, the long speech? Or These are the forgeries of jealousy, the, yes. the speech about climate change. As we yes, know. climate change. And she's speaking to Oberon. And in the theater, where I had the audience on three sides, still, I never saw my actor's face, Oberon, until I filmed it. I never saw it. But I had four cameras on that show. So the camera that was on the actor, David Harewood, I'll tell you, when you have, again, this reaction shot, not only did it enhance the meaning of the speech, but it made, again, for cinema, it made it shorter. If I was just giving a one camera on, on Titania, long, th that would feel very differently. But again, watching Oberon's face listen to her and his reaction blew my mind. I mean, I have to say I much preferred on film because of that. There's no way an audience in the theater would have that advantage of being able to see what that speech really meant to her partner, to, to Oberon. Yeah, that's brilliant, Judy. Peter? I, I mean, that, that is absolutely right. Um, the, there is a wonderful moment in the history of Shakespeare films being made when Peter Brook is filming his King Lear at exactly the same time that in Russia, Grigory Kozintsev is filming his King Lear, and they were corresponding with each other. Um, and Kozintsev's translation was done by Boris Pasternak, the novelist, Nobel Prize laureate, we know him as the uh, author of, of Dr. Shivago, of course, but, but an, an ex I gather from Russianists a brilliant, brilliant translation. And Pasternak at one point writes to Kozintsev and he says, you know, you must cut heavily, but every time you cut, what you have cut, you must make visual elsewhere in the film. We don't always have to hear that moment of Shakespeare's language, as it were, but we have to see what Shakespeare was talking about at that moment in a different way. And I think what, what the, that conversation was about is, is something that in a different way, Peter Brook was also trying to grapple with. How do, how do we make sense of this language in this very different medium? And Brook did something very extraordinary. Um, he got Ted Hughes, the poet, to translate Shakespeare's text into Ted Hughes. And it was a way for Brooke of starting to distance the Shakespeare text that was almost too familiar. Um, Hughes eventually backed out of the project. Nobody I know has ever read the whole of the Hughes draft. I don't know where it is. Uh, I, I talked to Jonathan Bate, who, who wrote a big, wonderful Hughes biography. He hadn't seen it in his researches. But Brooke wanted to find a way of, of getting away from, and then in the film itself, back to the language. And what he did in the end was, for me, I think it's, a, it's an astonishing film. It is so conscious in every frame of being a film. And he does things that are totally wacky that you should never do on film. He has somebody speaking where only half of their face is in the frame and the other half is, is out the side. And you think, why didn't you get the camera in the right place? But he doesn't want that. He wants us to notice where the frame is of the camera. The, the frame of, of, of film is controlling what we're seeing. And I think that's another way of, of thinking through reactions and the other things we've started to open up. Wow, thank you very much, Peter. My goodness, I'm, I'm already thinking about, oh yes, the, the, the half base shot. That's a good one to have in the uh, back pocket. Uh, Drew, I imagine some more questions are coming in. Uh, over to you. Yeah, I love what Peter, what Julie, Helen, all of you are saying. It's so fascinating. It, it 
makes me think, of course, of Orson Welles, who, who's a fellow, is really a very heavily edited and cut version of that play. And of course, Whose Chimes at Midnight is really an adaptation of Henry IV, focusing on Falstaff, but he makes the camera look with Shakespeare's eyes in a way. Um, I, I think a really fascinating question from Patricia, is there a play any of you would love to see filmed now? And is there one you think can't be filmed, that it's impossible to film? I think Julie, since you are our director, is there a Shakespeare play that you think is unfilmable? I think you're muted, Julie. Um, I don't know all the plays, so I, re I really couldn't tell you if they're unfilmable. I, I think there are ones like, um, oh God, what is it? Time in the Athens, I think is really current and would be a phenomenal film. And I thought about it, you know, and, and I thought about it with and without Shakespeare's language. I'm, I, I'm, I would probably want to do it with Shakespeare's language, but I just think it's, it's so contemporary uh, that it would make a fabulous, that's what you should do, Simon. You should be doing Timon because it hasn't been done, not Romeo and Juliet. <laughs> um, well, well, well. Thank you, Julia. Look, I mean, I mean, it, uh, anything can happen. Uh, I had the pleasure of directing uh, directing Town of Athens quite recently with Catherine Hunter, uh, of yeah, course. Yeah. In, in, it's in a wonderful thing. But, but maybe but, I. I don't think you know. Back to the thing about unfilmable. I. It just people can make a good film or a bad film. You know what I mean? It's like it's it's really up to the to the director and who they choose as their principal actors. So. I, I don't think there's anything that's that's uh, unfilmable at this point. But Helen, I wonder whether I can also extend that question to you. I mean, we, we haven't spoken about the regendering of Prospero, which happened Prospera in the film of The Tempest. I wonder, and I, I know that could be a, a topic on its own. We could talk about gender and Shakespeare. That's an episode in its own right. But but I wonder how that did feel, Helen. And I wonder whether we can adapt that question also for you about are there parts that you're longing that you feel this time needs of, of you. We talked about the sonnet earlier. Is there something? Yes, actually, I would love to play Juliet. <laughs> I want to do it. <laughs> <laughs> I never played Juliet and I was longing to play Juliet when I was younger. Um, <laughs> but, um, you know, I'm sure that part is taken. Um, you know, I think that the incredible thing about Shakespeare is I mean, sorry, it's such a cliche to say this, but there is a universality in all of the plays um, that any one of those plays could be taken now. I mean, I did the series of um, Henry VI parts one, two, and three, which is very specific, uh, but a specific moment in, in, in British history, um, the Walls of the Roses, um, you know, but again, with incredible universal themes of, of, of family, of, of violence, of um, greed, um, what has always led humanity into war since we were first appeared on this planet. The, um, so, you know, even that would be a, a, a wonderful film. Uh, um, Coriolanus, I think what an incredible, a modern piece of work Coriolanus is in, in this day and age in particular. Um, so I, I, I mean, I'm not familiar with all the plays at all, but um, uh, I, I can't think of, of one of them that would be wrong. I mean, what a wonderful version Ian McKellen did of, of Richard III n not so long ago, you know, transforming it into a comparatively modern era. And it, I thought that worked brilliantly, that film. I thought it was absolutely wonderful. Um, and I've forgotten what you asked me now. I'm so sorry. Well, no, 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 not at all, Helen. I, th I think we're all thinking about your Juliet and how excited we are about it. Uh, and who's going to get there first? Uh, <laughs> so I have an answer for you. Helen, uh, one, of, one of the assignments I, I give my students uh, is to imagine uh, a Shakespeare film that doesn't exist and to write the opening bits of the, of the screenplay and then to think about what they've written. And uh, a few years ago when I was using this assignment, one of them came up with a version of Romeo and Juliet which was set in a senior retirement home <laughs> in which um, the children and grandchildren of Romeo and Juliet were really upset about 
this elderly couple falling for each other. Now, you're nowhere near old enough to do that, but there is a way in which when we, when we rethink Shakespeare into different settings, and film has done this so often, just as theatre has as well, of course, all kinds of other things begin to become possible and different forms of relationship and different ways of thinking about things. And I think what, what film has often done is to go in a direction that we don't perhaps see quite enough of in the theater, which is full scale adaptation. Let's take the Shakespeare narrative and throw it up in the air and see how we can do it so differently. And I love a movie like 10 Things I Hate About You, which riffs on Taming of the Shrew. I love the animated kids version, and not just for kids, uh, of, of Romeo and Juliet with garden gnomes, Romeo and Juliet. Highly smart, clever movies that have done what Shakespeare himself did. Find somebody else's plot, rethink it, play with it, throw it around, and find and make something new and fresh into this new medium. And that seems to me to be another way of playing. Yeah, the expanded Shakespeare universe, if you will, right, of adaptations. Helen, were you? I just going to say, of course, it's what Shakespeare himself did. You know, I did Saxo Grammaticus's version of Hamlet um, uh, many years ago, um, which we shot in Denmark, which obviously, um, Shakespeare was riffing on when he wrote his modern, at the time, modern version of Hamlet with all the psychology, uh, you know, that isn't in the original um, uh, heroic poem that, that Saxo Grammaticus uh, writes. Um, oh, but I, we were talking about the, the gender change um, in, in The Tempest, which for neither Julie or I was remotely a stretch because um, I just funnily enough watched the play before Julie and I talk, started talking about doing it together. And I'd watch it, Derek Jacobi bring them quite brilliant, wonderful. Um, but as I was watching, I was thinking, my God, this could easily be a woman. You really wouldn't have to change any of the dialogue. Um, it, it's not like you're making Richard III suddenly into a woman or, you know, it year, which is tough, I think. And also, yeah. it, it came from an era when witches were being burnt at the stake. You know, the idea of a witch, of a woman with magical powers, um, was a very familiar understanding in uh, in Shakespeare's day. So, um, I, I think both Julie and I felt it was not a stretch, not a leap, not a sort of twisting. Um, it certainly made you re-look at the relationships and the relationship between Miranda and Prospero becomes non-patriarchal, -pa which I, I, th I thought was a great improvement myself. It's much more to do with the love and the knowledge of an older woman looking at a younger woman, seeing the kinds of mistakes she can make in love. Right. I mean, I'm I can we'll have more, more to add about that. Well, should we talk about The Tempest now? Is this... Is yeah, it... so we've been talking a lot about film. I know we're eager to get to some clips of The Tempest, but first, Simon, I'm wondering if you would like to tell our audience watching about our upcoming virtual gala first. Oh, thank you. Well, forgive, forgive me, everyone, if I do a quick ad break, as it were. Um, yes, on a Saturday, October the 3rd at 7 p.m., we will be hosting our first virtual gala called, appropriately, Shakespeare Everywhere. Uh, the gala is co-directed by Alan Paul and Leon A. Noble and will star such amazing folks as Angela Bassett, uh, Courtney B. Va Vance, Annette Benning, Judy Dench, uh, Liev Schreiber, uh, and many more will be helping us celebrate Shakespeare around the globe. Uh, the gala, of course, has always been an important component in our fundraising efforts, providing vital support for STC's artistic and education programs. To learn more, visit our website, because the good news, our gala this year is free. You can all come. So check out the website, uh, register, and join us live in a couple of weeks' time for our first ever virtual gala. Back to you, Drew. Uh, and who knows, you might be at a virtual Zoom table with uh, some very important friends of the theater. Uh, I hear rumors of, of things. Uh, so Julie, I wonder if you'd like to set up maybe this clip for us, what we're about to see. Is it the trailer or the clip? Uh, we have both, we have both, and we can play both, but uh, it's really up to you which one you would want to watch first or both or? Um, well, maybe it's good to show the trailer so that you see the whole world. 
and then we can do the 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 clip. All right. Okay. So let's let's. Better need that <laughs> To the point, the tempest that I bade thee, I boarded the king's ship. In every cabin, I flamed amazement. At first sight, they have changed eyes. Do you love me? Beyond all limit. They are both in either's powers. Misery acquaints a man with strange bedfellows. <gasps> <laughs> Hast thou not dropped from heaven? Out of the moon, I do assure thee. Caliban! This island is mine! With this, be sure tonight thou shalt have cramps. Here lies your brother, no better than the earth he lies upon. Draw thy sword. And I, the king, shall love thee. I will plague them all, even to roaring! I have made you mad. Stuff as dreams are made on, and our little life is rounded with a sleep. Wow. So so that is the world of the Tempest uh, yeah. in, in a few minutes or in a nutshell. Um, and, and now specifically this this next clip, I believe is Prospera's big speech, one of the most beautiful speeches in the entire canon. And it's with Ben Wishaw playing Ariel. And as you saw in the trailer, Ariel is air. I mean, this is literally, uh, he, he is a visual effect, but the, the fact is that the humanness of Ariel is the, is this incredible dichotomy, you know, is the is the irony of it. So this is the scene where he isn't invisible. Actually, you'll see where he where I decided to have the real actor be in the scene with Helen, you know, with Prospera, and you'll see why when you hear the language, you know, why why I chose to do that. Um, and as Helen said, this is the moment where she, she talks about what she has been able to do, how she used her power and exploited it, and actually how she lost control in a way. I mean, the, the, I think that this is what, when you have this great power, with great power comes great responsibility, another, another uh, topic. But, but this, is, this is what it is. And so um, I think we can look at this clip and talk, but I did wanna say one thing before because we didn't finish the gender thing because I had forgotten. I had directed The Tempest two or three times before on stage with men. So, and good, with wonderful actors. And I couldn't, when I asked Helen, because I think this is important to, to do this, uh, I, I think we both came at it at the same time in a way, actually, but, it, it was um, absolutely thrilling for me to experience it. The, the part of Prospera is not Prospero. There is a difference. We did change all the mums, you know, the sirs, and we went through it. We did a reading first. We were very careful about the text before we did it because we didn't want it to be a gimmick. 
And honestly, now I can say for me as a director and as a lover of the play, I much prefer it with a female. I much prefer it. I, I think we, we got a lot of criticism back in 2006 from Shakespeare scholars. I don't know, Peter, what you heard, but there was, oh, how could you take away that relationship, the patriarchal relationship? But so many other things came out of it uh, by having it in a woman's, you know, even just putting the garments back on. We don't have that scene, but having a woman put on her stays, on her corset, when she's been able to be so free, it really, it really does bring a lot. And at that time in 2006, there weren't a lot of women playing Shakespeare roles as there are now. So I think, I think Helen was, you know, really led the way. We led the way with that, and now it's opened up quite a, you know, a flood of of women not playing them as men, not playing them as men, but playing them as female if they work, and they don't always work. So and here, we're going to show this clip now. That, uh, when she puts the corset on, she looks like Elizabeth the first. Uh, well, I mean, Helen can talk to this, but just watching, for me, when she goes, um, what is it? When she goes, well, 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 or what, what are the words, the three words? Um, you repeat three, three words. Peter, you know, you know the Tempest. It's been too long for me. But it's, it's when the corset is tied tight by Ariel and she can hardly breathe. It has so much meaning by the physical action of, of the actor, of, of, of Helen. Uh, that isn't the same when Prospero got his robes. It was quite the opposite. Putting the corset and the long skirts and the collar back onto our Prospero was losing her freedom completely. And so it's, it, there's just so much, there are many, many, many more layers in this version, surely by, by having a, a woman as the lead character. So I, I know we're gonna run out of time. So you want Let, to yeah, let's, go to, let's go to this clip so we can, and it is about four minutes long, just so, so we know that it's an extended clip. Say, my spirit, how fares the king and his followers? Just as you left them. All prisoners, ma'am. The king, his brother, and yours abide all three distracted. But chiefly, him that you termed, ma'am, the good old lord Gonzalo. His tears run down his beard like winter's drops from eaves of reeds. Your charm so strongly works them that if you now beheld them, your affections would become tender. Dost thou think so, spirit? Mine would, master. Were I human? And mine shall. Dost thou, which art but air, a touch, a feeling of their afflictions, and shall not myself, one of their kind, be kindlier moved than thou art? Though with their high wrongs I am struck to the quick, yet with my nobler reason against my fury do I take part. The rarer action is in virtue than in vengeance. They, being penitent, the soul drift of my purpose doth extend not a frown further. Go release them, Ariel. My charms I'll break. Their senses I'll restore, and they shall be themselves. I'll fetch them, ma'am. Standing lakes and groves. And ye that on the sands with printless foot do chase the ebbing Neptune and then do fly him when he comes back. You demi puppets that by moonshine do the green sour ringlets make whereof the you not bites. And you whose pastime is to make midnight mushrooms 
that rejoice to hear the solemn curfew, by whose aid weak masters though ye be. Forth the mutinous winds, atwixt the green sea and the azured vault, set roaring war to the dread rattling thunder. Have I given fire and rifted Jove's stout oak with his own bolt, the strong based promontory? Have I made shake and by the spurs plucked up the pine and cedar? Graves at my command have waked their sleepers, oped and led them forth. My so potent art. But this rough magic I here abjure. And when I have required some heavenly music, which even now I do, to work mine end upon their senses that this airy charm is for, I'll break my staff, bury it certain fathoms in the earth, and deeper than did ever plummet sound, I'll drown my boy. Wow, that was. Amazing, always so amazing to hear that speech. And correct me if I'm wrong, Peter, but I believe this is Shakespeare's paraphrase of a famous spell cast by Medea in Ovid. Right. Uh, so in some ways, regendering the play corrects yes. what Shakespeare had, already had done to the classical sources. It was originally a female incantation. Yes, yes, we, 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 we discovered that as well in doing our research. That was a great discovery. Uh, I mean, um, I honestly, I'm convinced that if women had been actresses or allowed to act in, in that era, I think he would have written it for a woman, honestly. I, I, I do feel that. Um, you know, there were so many um, um, psychological things in it that, that, that were very female. That I absolutely understood as, as a woman. But it, but that speech in particular is so dense. It's so I, I think because it was a very late play by Shakespeare. I think if it he was a bit like Miles Davis in his improvisational mode, that he kind of is riffing and and inventing and and improvising with the language, even though it's all within an I, I'm, iambic pentameter. But some of those phrases are so complex, so weirdly you know, put together, whereof the you bites not or eats not, I can't, you know, the, the sheep doesn't eat it. What a weird way to say that, you know. It's, it's such a complex, um, linguistically so complex, that speech, and yet so sort of, um, oh my God, so, so meaty, it's extraordinary. Um, what I sense though, Julian Helen, is that one, Helen, you're there's an extraordinary naturalness. I mean, all the things we've been talking about tonight, about what cinema gives us, and that access to your thought, to this, to the extremely complex thought, yet the simplicity of a, of in a way that the sharing of it, as if one, one is totally at home, totally owning that thought. And, and it feels very transparent. And the other thing, Julie, I, I see when I see that clip is that there's an enormous amount going on, but not at the distraction it's not to take away from the language. It actually brings us closer to the language, culminating that remarkable close-up. And I think that's a real, that seems to be a huge lesson for, for us directors watching it about, yes, cinema needs, as Peter has talked about, the cinematic, the flamboyance, the reactions. And yet, in a way that so often on the stage, we get distracted by those kind of pyrotechnics. Cinema seems to be very at home with those things, well, certainly in, under your direction. And also, the, it's the juxtaposition of scenes. You see, this is a very long monologue, right, Peter? I mean, this is an extremely long soliloquy or whatever. And 
So you have three scenes here, really. You've got the scene with Ariel, and then it starts, the next one starts in that scene. And that's a very human interaction and very, you know, it's medium close-ups. It's not super close-up, but it's, it's medium. But then you go to the wide shot, you know, which we, we create with the circle of fire. This again is giving Prospera her power you know, the, it's, it, that's the choice of how it's directed, you know, the scenically, the camera move, all of it. And because the language is very dense and very complicated and hard to understand, really, I, it doesn't matter. That's one of the cases where the action of the character making the ring of fire, the wind, the torment, and as Helen says, she is she is vocally louder in that scene, in the in the fire scene, because she would have to be with the wind. But still, she's not she's not past her uh, ability to to bring forth the content or the the language in a clear way. But that. There is the visual effect that Shakespeare wrote, which is we need to see her almost out of control. But for me, the absolute climax of this is that, that camera moving in. And Helen, I mean, we didn't get to see it just now, so I got to listen again. The quality of the voice on film, when you have a great sound guy, and we had a great, because we were outside in wind. We, that was not in a studio. And he, she was able to have that kind of real fragile. Um, I, I think Helen's performance of this Prospera gets to the real fragility of the character and, 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 and plays against this pompous, almost narcissistic Prospero that I've seen too many times, really. I mean, there is a giant difference there. And understanding that uh, place where Prospero, Prospera is, in the breaking up of her voice is, or, the, or there's a gust of wind that just magically hit her hair or something at the time, not planned, believe me, not planned, is just extraordinary. And that's, that's our jazz, you know, when we play as film directors on set, there are gonna be these incredible moments that we get unplanned. Um, but I had a good time just listening to it. I couldn't see it this time, so of course, I was focused on Ben Wishaw's also extremely mm. beautiful rendition of the, of the language. Um, Drew's about to tell us everyone that time is almost up. So I'm wondering whether it might be great to have a chance for everyone just to give some final thoughts. Maybe Peter, you'd like to start. Then I, I was just going to add to that, that one of the things that is so brilliant in that sequence, we didn't mention at all, is the fantastic score by Elliot Goldenthal. Yeah. The, yes, the, what film music yeah. underscoring is doing the whole time is is helping us. It never gets in the way of of Helen's voice. It doesn't. It, it's always enhancing and never taking away. Um, I think film has has opened up all kinds of marvelous possibilities. I just want to mention one movie that that I'm currently fascinated by because it has only just appeared on DVD, uh, and that's a version of the Henry Four plays. Uh, called H4, uh, starring Harry Lennox, who of course played Aaron for Julie Taymor in her Titus, an entirely African-American cast set in, 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 uh, 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 in, in LA. I, I just love ways in which Shakespeare can be rethought now at, at a time when we're all thinking about BLM, H4 shows us a new direction. Wow, thank you very much, Peter. We will be tuning into that. And we'll be we do have one special question, another one from Maureen Dowd. For you, Helen, since you mentioned wanting to play Juliet, who would be your Romeo? <laughs> Some gorgeous young man. <laughs> that's what's forbidden. <laughs> well, that feels like the perfect way to, to wrap up this incredibly stimulating, I think very profound conversation about film and Shakespeare and The Tempest. I want to thank you all so much for joining us. Next week, we will be discussing Shakespeare's heroines with Dr. Carla Delegata, fellow Academy Award winner Helen Hunt, and playwright and director Madeline Sayet. So, so join us all next week for what's sure to be another wonderful conversation. Any last words, Simon? 
other no other than a huge thank you to what an extraordinary panel to julie helen and peter for making tonight so special and to all of you of course for listening and being part of the shakespeare hour live it's good night from me good night mm -hmm.